Let's open up our Bibles to First uh, Kings chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17. Let me just uh, start us off with a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity this time to gather in your presence, uh, to really allow your word to, uh, to speak into our hearts, speak into our lives right now. Father, this, uh, this concept of trust, Father, uh, this trust in you is, is a challenging one. It's a difficult one. And Father, we pray that today your word will reveal to us how we can get to that place. Uh, Lord, um, soften our hearts and prepare our, our eyes for what we are about to receive. Lord, in all this, we want to glorify you. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me talk to you about uh, ice houses, just for a moment. So there's a um, long, long time ago, uh, before there was uh, refrigeration, uh, what, what people would do is uh, build these, uh, these rooms that are basically sealed all the way around except for a door. There's no windows. And uh, what they'll do is uh, they'll take, uh, they'll go to a frozen lake, cut up the, uh, the large chunks of ice, and bring it into these rooms and cover, it over, it, cover over it uh, with sawdust. And then they would store their, uh, their foods in there. And, and, and a lot of times, this, this setup would actually uh, keep things frigid, cold, until... Uh, well into the summer, it's an, it's an amazing thing that uh, that uh, that this they've, they've, they've developed here, and and one time there, there's a story that goes like this: uh, uh, some workers were in this room, and this um, this man he had this uh, valuable watch, and somehow it, it fell off of his wrist and fell into the sawdust, and so the the workers came in, they they all looked through the sawdust, but they couldn't find the, this valuable watch. And so a little boy comes over, and uh, and he, um, you know, after the workers come out and they're uh, they're they're scratching their heads, they're uh, pretty much resigned in uh, to to trying to find this watch. This little boy goes into the room, closes the door, and after after a few moments, emerges from the room with the watch. And everybody looks uh, uh, looks at this boy and they, they they ask him, "How did you do it? How did you do it?" And the boy said, "Well, all I did was." I, go in, I went inside, closed the door, I, I buried myself in the sawdust, and I just listened for the watch, listened for the ticking. And sometimes, I mean, that, that story reminds me of how, how do we listen for God? How do we listen for God? We sometimes go to the, to the farthest of places thinking, I want to hear from God over here. I want, uh, we go on retreats, and, and we, we go to these far-off places thinking, if I remove myself from all these things, and if I go to this particular place or the, uh, have this particular time with the Lord, then I will hear from God. But what if we're going about it all wrong? What if, what if God is, is so close? He's, he's like right there talking to us, and he's, he's readily available. Today we're going to be talking about actually two things, hearing from God and trusting in God. Hearing from God and trusting from God. I mean, obviously, uh, if you don't hear from God, there's, you don't know what to trust in, in God for. But this story here, let me uh, just share a little bit of context. So, we're talking about uh, this northern kingdom. So uh, where we left off last week, the, the, Nor the, the United Kingdom of uh, Solomon and of David was divided because of a decision that uh, Rehoboam made. And now you got the northern kingdom uh, uh, separated, and they have their own, uh, their own form of worship, their own ways of going about worship. And um, now we come to Ahab. He's the seventh king of this northern kingdom. And, and when you look at Scripture, he's, he's often characterized as wicked. And, and as I shared before, there were no good kings in the northern kingdom. So, so this, this king in particular was considered wicked. He would, um, he would carry on uh, these, these pagan uh, religious, religious uh, practices, build uh, altars uh, uh, for, for these different gods, and in particular... He built an altar for the god of Baal, um, and Baal himself uh, was 
was a, uh, a religion that was practiced uh, by a lot of the tribes, a lot of the uh, neighboring nations of that time. But what did, uh, what did Scripture describe Ahab as? Ahab made an Asherah. Uh, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the, gods of, or all the kings of Israel who were before him. This is, this is how Scripture describes Ahab and his practices and his, his relationship with God. But the story is not about Ahab. This just kind of sets the stage for what's to come. There's going to be this, this battle, in a sense, between uh, Ahab, the king of Israel, and Elijah, the prophet. This is, uh, chapter 17 is this, this introduction of Elijah coming into, onto the scene uh, out of nowhere, it seems. And he has this a very special relationship with the Lord. And in verse 17, uh, chapter 17, verse 1, Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Elijah comes out of nowhere, comes up to Ahab, shares with uh, Ahab, there's going to be a drought that's going to come across this entire land. And, and then he departs. He leaves. And, and Elijah then follows what, what, uh, what God is calling him to do. Verse 2, And the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook, uh, by the brook Cherith which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So it goes to basically the, the eastmost part of the kingdom and hides out in this, this wooded area, and God would provide for him. Water, food, he's taken care of there. And, uh, and we see that he would continue to live there for, uh, for a period of time. We're not sure exactly how long. And then the word of the Lord came to Elijah once again. Cha uh, chapter 17, verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water and in a vessel that I may drink. And she said, uh, and as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord li your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of, couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Do you see what's going on? There's this uh, drought that has come across the entire land. The people themselves are, are experiencing this, this desperation. This, this particular widow has nothing left, basically, other than to look forward to die. You've got a situation, a very desperate situation, and then out of, out of the blue, a man comes over and he says, give me a drink. Give me, give me a little bit morsel in your hand. And she's like, I got nothing. But, but Elijah tries to turn this around. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you, uh, as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she, she and he and her household are for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Wow, imagine uh, imagine the faith and the trust that Elijah must have had to be able to say these things, to be able to uh, obey God, to go into this, uh, into, this, into this land that is 
desperate and desolate, empty of water, and to be able to say, don't worry, God's going to provide. How many of us are able to pray like that? Don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. What's it, what does it take to get from, from where you're at to be able to confidently say and to go into, uh, into all these different circumstances, into your, uh, into your workplaces, into your schools and whatnot, and to be able to say, don't worry, God's going to provide, and here is exactly how he's going to provide. A lot of us are probably scratching our heads and thinking, that's impossible. That's not possible in these days. Why? Why is that? Is it because we lack the Word of God? Because that's what Elijah was going on. He had the Word of God, Word of the Lord, that, uh, that was spoken through Elijah. What does it take for us to have that type of trust? In fact, we can also talk about the trust of this, this widow. This is a complete stranger. Your God says all this. As long as your God lives. But yet somehow in, in the midst of her circumstance, she still somehow is able to muster up the, the energy and the, uh, and the fortitude necessary to just bake some bread for this stranger. What trust she must have had. But then the story doesn't end there. I mean, not only are they experiencing this miracle of, of this flower that doesn't uh, seem to end and this jug that uh, never seems to, uh, to run empty. Verse 17. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. Like somehow his presence uh, revealed, this man of God revealed some sin in her life and she's thinking, oh, you, you brought this judgment on me. But completely missing, forgetting the fact that this man, this man of God brought this miracle into her life. Verse 18, and, and excuse me, verse 19. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him into, from her arms and carried him into the upper chamber where he lodged. And he laid him on his, on his own bed. And he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? I mean, this is a, this is a, 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 a natural response by Elijah. Like, Lord, what, what's going on here? I'm not, I'm, I'm not getting this. Why have you brought this upon this, this place? I don't understand. Verse 21, he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into, his, uh, come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and re he revived. This is the first instance of someone coming back to life in the Old Testament here. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, as if she uh, doubted before, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. This story is filled with trust. Do you not see it? It's filled with trust. How do we get to that point of trusting the Lord fully? How do you get to, to the point of trusting the Lord fully? Is it about studying His Word more? Like, like somehow reading His Word uh, just to somehow build your faith and your trust in Him, right? But yeah, actually it is. Let's, let's talk about this for a moment. So often we go around thinking, I want to hear from God. Oh, I'm so, I'm, I'm so envious that this person is able to hear from God. Well, hang on a second. What is this that lays before us? Do we not call this the Word of God? 
We have the Word of God right here in front of us. We have all of Scripture, His, his love letter to us. Uh, it reveals His personality. It, everything about God, at least to begin this relationship with God, is right here before us. I mean, we, we read in, in, in the Word itself. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We also read uh, from, from uh, 2 Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We also read in I mean, we read in, in the Old Testament all these things about the Word of God, the Word of God. Your Word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. We also read about how the Word is forever. The grass withers and, and flower fades, but the Word of God, our God will stand forever. We're, we may be looking in the wrong places for the Word of God when it's right here in front of us. It's right here. Where, where else do we need to go? Do you trust in everything that is being sp spoken of in here? Do you trust God in everything that he has spoken of in here? I can't tell you how many times I have had conversations with, with men. And I've asked them, are you ready to be discipled? Are you ready to disciple another? No. And in the back of my mind, I'm, th I'm thinking, have you not read the Word of God? This is what He's calling us to do. You taking the Word of God and, and throwing it to one side, saying, for, for whatever reason, like, I'm not, I'm not qualified to, to disciple. No, it's not about you being qualified to disciple. You are commanded to disciple. Matthew chapter 28, what does it say? We're called to go and make disciples of all nations. And yet, there are, there are men and women who are saying, no, I, I'm not ready to be discipled. No, I don't want to disciple. And we, we sell ourselves short, and we, we then come back to the place of, oh, I, but I want to hear from God. What are you talking about? The, the Word of God is speaking to us constantly. It's right here, right in front of us. And, and if we can't Hear his word right here and obey his word. What makes you think he's going to speak to you directly in this through, through, uh, this, through his special voice? If we're not hearing him directly, if we're not, if we're not looking at his word and obeying that, do we really need to go any further about hearing from God? You know, it's like it's like me me and my kids when they were young and and, um, and I and they know every morning every Sunday morning I, I'm I'm going to be going to uh, I'm going to be going to church early because I need to be there I don't want to miss a moment of worship they know that of me it's made clear but then for them to come to me and say on, on a Sunday morning where are we going Dad like are you kidding me. Have you, have, you, have, you not, uh, have you not known what I do every single Sunday? Are, are we going to have breakfast? You, you know the routine. I, I've laid it out before you so clearly. Are, are, are we going to take the big car or the little car? What, what are you talking about? You know, it, 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 and sometimes I have to wonder if God is like that with us. He gives us his word right here, this, this, this precious word, and he speaks to us and and for us to say, how come I can't hear from God? How come I can't hear from God? Well, no. It's less about hearing from God. Now it's more about trusting in the Lord. Because we have his word right here. He calls us to, to love one another. He calls us to love him. He calls us uh, to, uh, to lay down our lives, to count the cost in, in what... Uh, and understanding what it takes to be a disciple. It, he, he calls us to, to disciple one another. In Titus chapter 2, he calls the, the older to uh, mentor the younger. Are we obedient to that? 
Are we living that out at the very least? Because if not, we cannot expect God to speak to us in any other way if we don't, are not even obedient to, to the most basic of things, to the most fundamental of things. I mean, we talk about uh, men being the spiritual leaders of the home, right? That's, that's what I see in, in all of Scripture. In, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, in, in, uh, in, in Titus chapter 2, we, um, in, in second, I mean, I'm, I've been talking a lot about uh, second, uh, Samuel chapter 23, the mighty men of God. We're, we're men, men. Just for a moment, men, we are called to be legendary. We are called to be so legendary in the kingdom of God. We are called to, to go way beyond just following orders. Way beyond following orders, guys. We are called to just hear the whisper of God and then jump into action and take all the gifts that the Lord has, has given us and and apply it in some, some powerful and magnificent ways. This is the calling of all men. And then there are some men that just turn around and say, like, no, I, I, I'm good. I, I, I'm, I'm happy where I'm at. Men are called to, to love their wives, to lay down their lives for one another. Men, are you doing that? I mean, it's... It, you don't have to hear from God an audible voice. It's written explicitly in the Word of God right in front of us. Are we being obedient to that? Okay. It, we to, we got to hear directly from God. Just looking at His Word. Start here. Trust in what He has to say. Then the next part. I, I, I call it following without logic. Following without logic. A lot of times, uh, we will tend to look... I mean, if, if we see God saying this, God calling us to do this, our, our postmodern mentality is to come forth and say, well, why? why? Why are we doing that? Is it not enough to recognize it is God saying this? I mean, I, I, I really appreciate uh, the armed forces, the, the, that military training, where uh, if... If a superior, a commander, or whatnot gives an order, the, the, the focus is we just follow through on that, on that command and that order, especially in, in times of war, in times of battle. You, you don't have time to think like, oh, you know what, maybe we should turn left instead because I, I, I think, I think this, this makes much more. No. If the leader says, go right, we should be going right. And not have to worry about, does it make logical sense? No. It's just the fact that this is our leader calling us to do this. This is God, just merely God calling us to do this. Shouldn't that be enough to just follow and obey? You know, we, we, we tend to, to take, take, the, uh, take the opposite approach and say, oh, I'm not qualified. I'm not skilled. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ready to do that for whatever reason. But... Again, when you look at, look at the Word of God, what, is it, what do we see? God calls the least qualified people to do the most miraculous things. And if you're asking yourself, thinking to yourself, oh, man, I'm not qualified, you are exactly the one that God is looking for. He's saying, like, I, I, I've been looking for someone just like you. Why, Lord? Okay, yeah, no, I shouldn't ask why. I'm just going to go. And, and that that faith to just follow what God is calling us to do allows us to, to experience miraculous things. Look at, look at this passage, Luke chapter 6. This is, um, Jesus is speaking to a group of his disciples, and there's an even larger group that is gathered around, people that, are, that have uh, seen and witnessed all the miracles that Jesus has done, and they're wanting to come closer to Jesus and touch him. And Jesus uh, shares uh, this long list of things, and then uh, at the end of this chapter, he uh, says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you call me like, like I, am, I am a superior to you? And do not do, and not do what I tell you. Who, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He's like a man 
building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. Laid, laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and, and uh, could not shake it. Sorry. Let me, uh, sorry, Q, go ahead and uh, go ahead and drive it. Uh, it's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, a stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it had been built well. But who, the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Do you see what, what Jesus is trying to convey? You don't recognize me for who I am? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you're not doing any of the things I'm calling you to do? You know what you're like? You who, who hear my word, who recognizes me as Lord, you are like a, one who builds a house on a solid foundation. You who, who see my word, who read my word, who hears my word, and yet you don't do anything with it. You disobey. You are like this man building on, on, on a sandy foundation. And, and, and this is like a mic drop for, for Jesus. He's just like, that's, that's all I need to say. Are you going to follow me or not? Because of who I am. And then the last part is this releasing of the time constraint. When I, look at, uh, when I look at what Elijah is going through here, when I look at uh, all the things that, uh, that he is doing, he is, not, uh, he is not constrained by time. He is not saying, oh, um, I'm going I'm to stay over here for an X period of time, and then I'm going to go over here. No, he just, he just follows the Lord and when the Lord says go, he goes. When the Lord says stop, he stops. When the Lord says go to this house, he goes. And when he says, uh, when he uh, speaks to him and uh, says, you say these words to this widow, he says it. He's following, and he's not concerned about how long this is going to take. What's going to, uh, what? I mean, there. I mean, Elijah. Obviously, this was before the time of computers. But he, if he had a computer, he would uh, not be worried about spreadsheets. He would not be worried about uh, projections and whatnot. He would just, he just uh, concerned himself with what is God calling me to do next. You know, we we off, again we often think about. What am I going to do next? Uh, I need to plan out my five-year plan, uh, six-year plan, ten-year plan, whatever. We need to uh, plan out our, our, our retirement and all this. And when, when all, all the while, God is saying, don't worry about it. Have I not said I'm going to provide for you? Seek first the kingdom of God and, I will, uh, and all these things. Well, what? Will be added unto you. Amen. Amen. You know, it, it's, do we trust God? in what he says. I think for, for a lot of us, even, even more critical is, are we able to go all the way back, all the way to the beginning, and recognize who is God in our lives? Who are you, Lord? What, what, what is it about you? And the beautiful thing about all of that, even that last question, is found in his word, right? Everything we want to know about God found right here. Everything we want to know about Jesus, the starting point is right here. I've, I've talked about who Jesus is, right? Oh, oh, for the last number of weeks, Jesus uh, would, uh, would, would say uh, in, in the book of John, he, would, uh, there, he has these seven I am statements, right? He says exactly who he is and then uh, turns it around and says, what do you think? I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am, uh, I am the gate. I am the uh, good shepherd. I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you believe it? Do you trust in that? For some of us, we may need to start there. Look at the Word. Look at what the Word says about who God is, who Jesus is, and start there. And ask yourself, do I trust God? And if you're able to start there, then you can move on to the next part. Can you obey his word a little bit more each day? And that's my challenge to you. Take 
his word. Read it every day. And challenge yourself. Oh, I just learned something new today. And I got to obey it. You take that deep breath and you say, all right, Lord, you are God. I'm going to obey. I'm going to obey this. Oh, Lord, you, you call me to, to, to love my neighbor. Okay, I'm going to obey that. You call me to trust in you. Okay, I'm going to obey that. A little bit at a time. One day at a time. A little bit of his word each day. Let's come, come before the Lord in prayer. You know, as we bow our heads, I want to challenge you to, to really ask yourself, what is it that keeps me from, from trusting God? Is it, is it doubt? Maybe we don't trust God because we don't know about, enough about him. And if that's the case, then our prayer, I know exactly what our prayer is going to sound like. Lord, I need to know who you are. Teach me who you are. Remind me that you are the creator of the universe. Remind me that you are all-powerful. That the power that was able to raise Jesus from the grave, that same power exists right in front of me. There's power in the name of Jesus in itself. Lord, remind me of the power of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit reveals, how the Holy Spirit empowers. For some of us, we need to go all the way back and begin with this relationship with God. Lord, I trust you. I trust you with all of my heart. And for some of us, we, we do trust God. But now it's a hard situation where we need to surrender ourselves, surrender our abilities, surrender our pride, surrender our shame, and just come before the Lord and say, yes, yes, Lord, I will obey I see your word, I hear your word, and I will obey because I trust in you. Lord, Heavenly Father, I lift up to you, my brothers and sisters, in person and on online, and I pray that you will just help each and every one of us to grow in faith in you, to grow in that trust in you, to come to a point where every single thing that you tell us to do, you call us to do in Scripture, we will strive to live out in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Father, we recognize it's going to be a challenge. Father, we recognize it's going to be hard and it's going to require us to swallow our pride, but we know that on the other side of that is going to be goodness, is going to be a miracle, is going to be the very thing that we needed, the healing, the love, the peace. Lord, we recognize all that is found in you alone. Thank you, Lord, for this reminder of this trust. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.